My name is Sue Parham, and I'm going to be the moderator today. Um, my background is in uh, product creation, but I've kind of uh, changed a little direction in the last few years, and really um, women's empowerment is my thing. So I work with Women's Center for Leadership. My pet project these days is the Compass Project, which is about getting more women elected to more offices. So um, there's information about that in the back. That's what makes me so excited about what we're going to talk about today. Because if you believe that women have so much more to offer than they ever have in the past, this is the talk for us. So the, the Nightwood Society um, is called a vibrant community space, a creative studio and a bold experiment that reimagines experiencing food and drink and design in an entirely different way. And what we're going to do today is kind of explore the many different things that they're bringing together to truly make that a creative endeavor that makes their heart sing. So first, I'd like to have each person um, introduce themselves, what they do, so uh, we can dig in and, and really figure out what they are doing here that makes it different. So if we can just pass this down. Um, Hello, um, my name is Michelle Batista, and I am the proprietress of this lovely establishment co-owned with my cohort on the inn, Katie Reardon. My name is Leah Scaife. I am the director of experience here at the Nightwood. My name is Camus Davis. I'm the owner of the Portland Meat Collective, which is now living here, and um, the director of culinary education and other kinds of education. My name is Sarah Schneider, and I'm going to be, or I am the kitchen queen of the Nightwood, so I cook all the good things. And Michelle already announced, but I'm Katie Reardon, and I'm also a proprietress here and enamored by all of these ladies literally every single day. So I'd like to start at the very beginning um, and talk with Michelle, because this is a really interesting space, but I think half of us don't know what it is, why we're here, and what's going on here. So tell us, tell us about the Nightwood Society. Where are we? Sure. Um, that is the number one question. Mm -hmm. uh, people are enamored and a bit confused about what we are, so I think the best way to describe this, it is an experiment, um, and the best way to describe it is we think of it as a creative incubator. I come from a long background like Sue in product creation and design. I also own a design consultancy called Stockpot Collective, 16 years now. Um, I've spent 25 years in the design world in New York and then here. And about seven years ago, I started thinking about what really, what things I really valued outside of the design world. And those things were always the same. They were food, farms, and community. So I started working in the food world and getting um, steeped into the farm world and where things come from and how they're grown. And I decided that I wanted to shift a lot of the focus of the creative consultancy to food and food producers and food products. So I opened another event space in town, started working with a restaurant, um, and got deeper down this food rabbit hole, which you, if you're like me, fall in love with and can't get out of. Uh, and then at the beginning of this year, I decided that I really wanted to bring that all under one roof. So I envisioned this idea of this space, which is now the Nightwood. Um, and I started talking with my dear friend Katie about what that would mean. Um, Katie's also a product director. And we decided we would build this team with a number of ladies. That wasn't the initial, oh, you, sorry. No, go ahead. Let's pass that one down, too, because I'm curious, this idea of you know, product creation of, of this space and this experience, this is a long way from an agency, right? We're no longer in an agency. Sorry. I'm too close to yeah. the speaker. <laughs> so what's really happening? What, what is it exactly? Sure. I wonder if we can put the two mics together now. 
Um, what is happening? We are hosting private events and gatherings of all kinds. We're developing our own programming, workshops, classes, education series, um, and we're promoting those through our website. Those are all ticketed events. We're trying to create one-of-a-kind experiences for the public at large, um, whether that be private, you know, a wedding, or whether that be we did a farm to turntable dinner that was literally off the hook. This place was jamming. Um, it was so fun. People still stay till 3 a.m. I was shocked. Um, so we've been having a lot of fun. It changes every single day in here. It looks like this today. This is the first time it's ever looked like this. Um, last night we did a fundraiser um, for Portland Feeds Puerto Rico um, to help with those efforts. So it was set like a totally different party. Um, and then we're trying to innovate. This is a bit of a food laboratory. Sarah runs the kitchen, but we all come with ideas of things that we want to make, things we want to explore. That all gets to happen here. Um, because we're not a restaurant, and this is a big distinction to make, uh, we can do all of this. We can play, we can pivot, we can turn on a dime, we can take your great idea that you just brought to me and say, yeah, let's, let's do that. And so we, do, we end up saying that a lot, like, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, let's see how that works. So just to clarify, you're not a restaurant, not a but restaurant. you are a, food, a what? A vehicle for food and drink and design. Hmm. Stockpot offices are also housed here as well. So we're doing design work on site. Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of food styling in my design world. So that happens right here as well. Um, so on, on the daily, there are four hmm. different things happening on any given day. All of them in, in the love and service of food and design. So I saw another thing on the website that you're kind of kicking, what was it? Kicking the status quo to the curb. And the status quo, I guess, would be that this be a dining space, a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So is that what you mean by kicking status quo to the curb, or is there more to that? There's a lot more to that, <laughs> Sue. <laughs> um, yes, all of those things, but also, like I said, we're woman run, woman owned, and that is because well, many reasons, this has been the one hell of a year. Um, but also, we want to give women opportunities in this space. It turns out kitchens, I mean, not unlike any other industry really, banking, politics, it doesn't really matter, um, primarily run by men. And it's our intention to give these ladies a fair shot and allow them to be creative. Uh, they're all incredibly gifted and talented in their craft and we really want to help them hone that. Uh, a huge part of our focus is in education and skill sharing. Um, we talk a lot about our community at large, but we also have this very tight internal community, and every day that community inside these walls, and those, we have a core group, I mean this is the core group, but we have a core group of 10, but then we invite people in, and then we focus our efforts on how do I, help Sarah understand the design process. How does Sarah teach me how my knife skills? And so we're constantly sharing our skill set to grow um, and develop. So uh, the vision, ultimately, mm -hmm. tell us about the vision for how you're pulling this all together. Sure. The Nightwood is the physical space. So this container that we've created to do this work, um, which we firmly believe needed to happen, this was a huge difference between it being a virtual reality, um, an online platform, mm -hmm. versus uh, a container of space mm -hmm. and inviting people in. This is the Nightwood. The larger vision is this idea of the Nightwood Society, which allows women around the world, men around the world, to come in and be a part of the things that we're creating to help them connect the dots in their own communities between food and design and bring those to the public. Hmm. Okay, so the container, which I think is a really interesting and different way to talk about it. So it's kind of your palette, I guess, for putting on these various experiences. Yes. It's the canvas for your art. Yep. We talk about the canvas a lot mm -hmm. um, within these walls. We each have a different canvas. Um, but the interesting thing about it is because we're not a restaurant and we're not formulaic in that way, we each get to have our blank canvas that we create. And it's been really empowering to give each of these women freedom and autonomy to create on their palette. Mm -hmm. And there's so much trust and support built into the system that it's it's working so well. So for me, I think of my canvas 
Um, I mean, I'm always the one up here. Leah can tell you. Leah does all the, the good things. I'm the one that's with all the ideas. Um, but I thought a lot about this leading up to this talk, and um, I really got to this place where, you know, why I did this, why I wanted to do this from the beginning was about community and building a real community. And so I think of community as my canvas. I'm really good at finding talent. I'm really good at bringing people together and inspiring them to, to be their best selves. Mm -hmm. And so I always think from that vantage mm -hmm. point first. Mm -hmm. But each of these ladies will have a different story about their own canvas. So interesting, almost like a recipe, right? Sure. The people you bring together, like, like the raw materials you bring together. Like stock. Mm -hmm, like stockpot. <laughs> okay, let's let's talk about more uh, the environment. So, Leo, I'd love to hear about your canvas here because um, she just mentioned that your canvas is this space. So, talk to us about how um, bringing people into this home of yours is something that you craft, and the experience is something that you craft. Yeah, definitely. Um, so my title is Director of Experience, which was part of, I guess, how Michelle's um, strategy for looping me in. She's like, what if I gave you the title Director of Experience? <laughs> um, I had already made my mind up that I was planning on joining the team, but that, I thought that was pretty cute. Um, I, worked on that for, I worked on you for a long time. <laughs> um, so I have been in event production and planning for about a decade now. Um, my experience has varied widely. Um, for the most part, I spent um, seven years with a company called Outstanding in the Field. So I traveled around and did dinners uh, on farms and in various locations all across the country. Um, so to this point of talking about a canvas, for me, there were so many variables that were changing every single day. And my canvas really was, um, you know, whatever, wherever we landed that day. So whether it be on a beach or in a farm field or a vineyard or um, really anywhere, the idea was that always we were at the source of ingredients and we were bringing people together at a long white table to um, have a dining experience and then also share the story of the people and the place and the ingredients that they were enjoying. Um, so many different factors from the weather to yeah, the landscape, everything changed. Really, the only constant was my core team and the table every every time. So, um, yeah, very different from now. Here I have, for the first time, um, uh, the constant is the actual container, like we've been talking about, um, which is super interesting for me. It presents itself. I'm a, I'm a systems person, turns out. Um, so it's pretty neat that um, I, I also have to kind of shift my thinking in that I can create a lot more constants here in the sense of those systems and how we set up events. Um, but then I think that also provides a lot of freedom in terms of um, thinking about what sort of different things can happen in this space. And of course, a lot of it's still centered around food and sharing story and um, you know talking about where the ingredients are coming from, but there's so many different ways that that can happen in this space. So Michelle talked a little bit about this was the first time this space had ever reflected this setup. Yeah. How different can this space be? How much liberty do you have to play with it? Um, you know, where will you go with the container? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's endless. And what's, I mean, this is all very fresh. Um, so we've really only been operating in this space for a month and a half. Um, a lot has happened already, obviously, but there's still a lot of um, different ideas. We, even just last week, we did um, five different events in the space, and every single day was different. We did a couple of holiday parties, we did like a business lunch meeting, um, we did a pop-up market with all women artists and makers one day, and then the next day we did an afternoon tea party. So if you can imagine, those were all very different setups. Um, Right now, I mean, at last week we were figuring out what that looked like every day. It was different, um, so I'm excited to sort of get that, those concepts as far as like what the space layout is under the belt, and then, like I said, have more freedom to think about, you know, the greater 
messaging and people involved and um, different experiences that we can create within that. So I'm just kind of putting this together like you guys are. You talked about community, and you're talking about this moldable space. Does that ultimately mean that whether it's Yancey or Tyson or Gina, um, if we want to bring people together, um, we can use this vehicle with your talents or this, this case with your talents and put something together that, that reflects um, a statement or a story we want to make? Is that your yeah, idea? Yeah, I mean, e exactly. I mean, I think there's, um, as far as events go just in general, I think they're just a really amazing tool and vehicle for messaging and education and sharing story. So there's a lot of opportunity So what's your there. process? How do you begin? Because every, every <laughs> artist has that, you know, way that they do their research or, or begin their projects. When you're putting together an event uh, or an experience, how do you start? Yeah, for me, it's always about the people, um, whether it be the, well, of course, the people who we're having at the event, um, and then also all the other people involved, um, even like Sarah with her cooking and food and on the beverage side, um, who we're sourcing wine and cocktail ingredients from, um, and just thinking about how we can put all these pieces together and then share just, yeah, putting all the pieces together and sharing the story behind everything. Okay. I can't wait. I can't wait to see various transformations. Yeah, me too. <laughs> all There's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to move down and talk to Camus for a second. She has a background that's fascinating. I, I was reading this earlier this week, and she studied butchery in France. I mean, how unique and fascinating and fabulous is that? And, um, you know, her position here is education. It, it's to, you know, be able to bring education to the community. And, uh, you know, I'm just curious about education as the as the canvas and butchery how that all works into this talk to us a maybe maybe kind of tease us with a little bit of that background too the studying butchery in France <laughs> well I have some mariettes back here I'll just pull out um, uh, let's see that's a big question and, and, um, and okay I, I think butchery is is that an art or is it you know yeah uh, yes, it is an art. Um, you know, I think for me, butchery um, was a metaphor for uh, uh, learning where things come from. Was a way learning butchery was a way to engage in the world around me. It was a way to um, ask hard questions. Um, so for me. Uh, you know, I probably could have been studying anything in France. I was searching for those kinds of answers. I wanted to ask those kinds of questions. And so for me, education, be it hosting a, a whole animal butchery class here or teaching people how to make shoes, I would not teach that class, but someone might, um, is, is about that searching, is about bringing people into a space where they feel comfortable asking questions, being curious, um, becoming active participa participants in the processes by which food gets to our table, by which shoes walk us down the street. Um, and I think a space like this is in the spirit of, of that kind of searching and that curiosity. Um, so for me, whatever educational programming we have here will always be in service of that. Um, I, of course, we'll probably have, um, you know, opportunities for you all to drink wine and watch someone chop some carrots if you if that's your thing but for me I want you guys to chop the carrots I want you to to maybe make the wine I want you to engage with the people on this side of the room such that we're creating the space together and for me education is a way to to tie all of what we're talking about um, in in into one thing so we all know that wine and knives are a really good combination. <laughs> so we're really excited to sign up. Um, <laughs> but tell us a little more about how that plays into the experience and the collective. Why education is part of this whole program? Why do you feel that um, bringing that to the community is a big part of the Night with Society? 
Well, I think like Michelle said, I mean, we are all here to learn from each other. I mean, Sarah and I are so excited to work together because she's also a butcher. Um, uh, and, and I'm able to hold a butchery class here and then have someone like Sarah not only teach me, but teach our students, okay, not only is it about cutting up the animal, but how do we use the animal? How do we use a, a lamb neck? We were just talking about the glories of lamb neck. Um, and also because we're uh, somewhat vegetable focused here, which I'm also excited about, um, people like Sarah and I then have to learn, okay, how do we think about meat as an accent to a meal? How do we um, you know, make it a part of the, the culinary ethos of the menu, but not so much a main, a main attraction? And, and so we're learning from each other in that way. Um, you know, Leah and I are learning from each other because I have to bring three sides of pig in once a week and Leah has to deal with that. So, you know, we're learning about logistics and that kind of thing. And I think if we're learning from each other, the goal is for our clients and the people who are coming into the space to be learning from us, but us to be learning from them as well. And so any kind of, again, any kind of educational experience we have is going to be in the service of that skill sharing um, and, and, uh, and that curiosity, that spirit of curiosity. It's interesting since this um, seems to be multiple competencies, you each seem to run your own area as opposed to one person at the top of the hierarchy saying, we're bringing in three sides of pig. Um, you each kind of have to expose and work together, kind of knit things together. It sounds like a little more. Absolutely. And I think our classes are going to feel the same way. It's mm -hmm. going to feel like people coming into a space with, with different... Um, uh, focuses and different pieces of knowledge and, and bringing it together in the space and then the space becomes this new thing through that. It's a little abstract but so that's what education classes. should do. I, I think, you know, when we were talking beforehand, you talked about the classes might feel a little bit different than um, a lot of the culinary classes around town. G any, any tease for us about how they might feel different or... Yeah, I mean, any of you, if any of you have taken a Portland Meat Collective class, um, you're picking up a knife, you're getting your hands dirty, you're facing a whole pig on the, on the counter. Um, I want all of our classes to feel that way. So, um, again, you're going to be an active participant in, in whatever we're learning on any given day. Mm. Wow, that sounds so exciting. Kind of, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, you usually don't see or think of people like Camus and Sarah being butchers. You know, that's not my stereotypical, which unfortunately I have one. But um, you don't think of that. Um, Sarah, in fact, I met Sarah about a month ago when um, the Nightwood was opening and I was invited to an event here. And at the very end of our event, she was preparing for the next one coming up. And she was making crepes. And I walked up to talk to her and she was standing here at the counter. And, um, you know, she started tossing me these little, you know, edges, right? The bad pieces. <laughs> and I understood at that moment how you could make magic because she took flour and water and I swear to God, I didn't need anything on that crepe. Just eating that dough was amazing because it wasn't just your normal flour and water. It was something really special. Um, I think it was a, a sourdough uh, base or something like that. Is that right? No, I put a sourdough starter in it. So friends of mine make bread and as we we're talking about with um, our community there's also within the community there's different villages so where there's a bread village so I called my friend and I said hey you have a sourdough starter for me I'm gonna make some crepes and she said of course so I took that from her and made it into crepes there was also other than flour and water there was maybe a little bit of butter I'm not gonna lie <laughs> there was a little bit of butter to make it a little delicious Okay, it was half butter, but whatever. <laughs> so half the reason I stood at the counter is because she's also a comedian, and it was really fun to sit there, but man, it was good eating that butter and flour. It was really, it was magic, I've got to say. So we've always known that food could be magic, and Sarah was also kind of telling me a little bit about introducing her family to magic, right? Because wouldn't you think that if you became a magic chef, you could go home and just absolutely woo your family with that? And that's the case, right? 
No. Uh, so well, one of my main ties to this is like the being able to be as creative as I want. We have so many different outlets, as we've all been discussing, within the education system, within we all, what we're all doing, and within our own backgrounds coming into it. And my background is with a family that doesn't really care for food. So for Thanksgiving, they're big fans of cauliflower puree instead of your mashed potatoes. And a little tuna tartare in the winter with some strawberries on the side. It's like, come on. This is not delicious. <laughs> you can do better. So I'd bring like, you know, I'd spent in my early years of cooking, I'd spend all this time creating what I thought was going to be a masterpiece for them. And I'd take it and they'd pick at it and I'd be like, I guess it's, you know, whatever. But this, this cauliflower puree recipe I got the other day and I was like, oh my God, I'm done. No more. So now I only do Thanksgiving with friends. <laughs> way easier, they appreciate it way more. Um, and it just kind of works out that way. The funny thing, she was talking about her family, like, you know, preferring watching TV and sports over this. And I, I thought our stories were going to be very similar, pizza and beer or hamburgers and beer. And she started talking about tuna tartare. And I was like, okay, our families are not similar. <laughs> we have a different sports family. But so as I was saying, we always have known that there is this incredible creativity. You have... You have this entire place to think of in terms of um, a culinary experience. I'm kind of curious about how you see this as your canvas. And um, yeah, let's just start there. Well, I'm fortunate enough to have traveled and worked all over the country in different ways and forms and crazy out crazy different platforms and so to have this sort of platform where I'm able to be challenged every day. So walking in and like coming into the different opportunities for different, whether it be classes that Camus and I are teaching where I get to put my, my butchery skills to use or whether I'm making crepes or whether, whether I'm making, doing a tea party. I'm able to use what I've learned over the years and create and help, help people exercise their dreams of what they want to eat too. So, and being able to be surrounded by so much talent and so much excited, so much excitedness is definitely encouraging to what I'm able to do. So is there kind of a standard menu you draw from? No, basically, you know, it's like, you know, every other Port Pacific Northwest cuisine, everybody, we get, everything grows in Portland. We get everything at so, like such a beautiful product that comes in seasonality. So being able to be like, oh, it's winter, squash is around. Um, I'm really excited to play with that and do different things with that and how would you like that and the different seafoods and the different, I mean, anything that is able to just come together. So working with seasonality is very cool. So your canvas starts from scratch. Every day, pretty Every much. Every day. And it's like, okay, so we're doing a tea party today, and tomorrow we're doing dinner for 50, and then there's a little tiny lunch. Okay, cool, what do we have in the fridge? Okay, so in product time. creation, we thought delivering several lines a year was a big deal. And I'm sure for all of you guys, you know, I mean, keeping up with that schedule, but having to create every day, how do you do that? <clears throat> it's magic. Um, lots of salt, lots of butter. Just kind of, um, like I was saying before, within my favorite part of um, being this part of this community too is, as I was saying, the villages. So being able to call on my farm friends and I'm like, what are you growing for me right now? What's really good? And they're like, I have this amazing flower. It's like, oh, you have amazing flour? I can make amazing pasta with amazing flour. Oh, you have amazing potatoes. Oh, I should make gnocchi. Like being able mm. to reach out and then, you know, calling my pig farmers and they're like, I have suckling pigs that are ready to go. I was like, perfect, that'll feed 50 easily. So being able to reach out to the different villages in our community to create everything helps, helps me and it allows me like the, being in restaurants for years, you have the stagnant, like, okay, I have to have all these sauces and everything ready to go on this plate at this time every day. And it's nerve-wracking and it's so stressful. So this is like, oh, this is relaxing. So I get to come in and just like, I just get to create stuff instead of having the stress of what am I going to do? Oh my God, there's so much to do for just today. I'm like, okay, it's a new canvas every day, but it still is like new, challenging, exciting, as opposed to the same stuff that's going on the plate every other day at a restaurant. Um, the, but then I get to do the butchery, which is the same stuff every day and the same stuff every time and the repetitiveness and the teaching that and showing and I think it's just magic. So you have to have one or two pieces of magic that you come back to all mm -hmm. the time. What are they? My you one or two pieces to. of magic? Yeah, well, you know, magic God. things to serve, like to make our oh, mouth water. Things here. that I, 
Oh my goodness. What's that? Raclette. Oh my god, the vegetables and winter cheese, cow's milk cheese from France in the, in the Alpine area. Raclette cheese melted on vegetables. That's the go-to. So delicious. And green goddess dressing, also a good one. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, being it's hard to say the one thing. Like, it's the one challenge we have as chefs in this world is like, oh, what kind of food do you make? It's like, I don't know. I can't tell you that. Like, I make a ton of different kinds of food, and they're all really good, so trust me. <laughs> Just taste it. It's going to change your life forever, for so sure. So it's about materials for you. If you were limited in materials, you're yeah. on a desert island, you have five things. Um, if you were limited in, with materials, does that limit? I'm kidding. No. No, it doesn't. Your, does it limit your creativity? No. Because you can, I mean, I don't think it does, that would do it for, like, for anybody. Like, I feel like we are all able to create anything from anything that's good. And that's, like, where it comes from for me is, like, being able to, you know, with time crunches and with being able to have such amazing product around, you can still create all the good things. So being able to just be creative. So the web website kind of talks about you being the queen of, mm. of culinary here, the queen of the kitchen. What does that <laughs> reign oversee? <laughs> I mean, it's just because I'm very bossy <laughs> and I demand attention from people regularly and if they don't get it, I'll like, they'll feel, they'll feel my wrath. <laughs> Um, no, it's just basically, you know, we're all given our titles and it's sort of uh, also one of the ways I was brought into it. <laughs> Listen here, Queen. And I was like, okay, I'm in. I like it. But yeah, I basically came into it as the also, you know, to help with the standards. Like I come from working in kitchens with, you know, mostly men. Same with butcher shops, mostly men. And to the idea of coming together within an area to have all these women surrounding and the encouragement that comes with that is very enticing. Like, I have had very uh, many, many, many supportive men in my life in, in the culinary industry as well, but to have this kind of productive creativity that helps empower me in this, in this, in this whole situation. So to bring it all together in the food side of things, I feel bright every day because there's women who are just encouraging me and it's great. So environment kind of creates that. Environment changes everything. <laughs> and same thing. It's so bright and light in here instead of in a dark basement kitchen. So that helps too. Well, speaking of bright light, I have to say that Katie Reardon has been a bright light for me. I met her years and years ago. And um, I think she has one of the most creative minds I've ever met. She doesn't use clay. She doesn't use paint. None of those things are her canvas. But I truly feel that her creativity is um, this almost this tangible thing that you can feel. But it's very different. It's business. It's business. Um, so that's kind of your role here um, mm -hmm. with the night. Tell us a little bit about your role and, and you know how it brings out your creativity. Well, before I get into me, I would like to say the exact same thing about Miss Sue. So you do the <laughs> same you. thing for me, and I really appreciate that. Sue's been a huge mentor to me since I came back to Portland about six years ago, and we work together. So I take your energy and turn it into all the magic that I, I love to thrive in. So thank, thank you very you. much, and thanks for being here with us. Um, so yeah, uh, me. Okay, so looking at all of these amazing women especially when I look at these three and they all have a really unique skill set. So I don't cook, I'm gonna be honest. My boyfriend's in the audience, he can attest. My knife skills are a complete disaster. Um, I don't know how to do details, so I'm not great at organizing events. But what I am is a total nerd in the sense that I love to talk about business, I love to talk about strategy, I love to weave together really creative ideas my dear friend here, Michelle, and figure out how to turn them into new businesses and scale them and how to bring people together. And, and so I think for me, the Nightwood is such a new opportunity. Um, I've been in corporate America my entire career, so for the last 15 plus years, um, and have had the amazing opportunity to learn and work with some of the brightest in the business. So from a product standpoint, I feel like um, I've been really lucky to experience a lot of that and bring those learnings here to the Nightwood. I think what's interesting is right now, all of you, again, this is our first. We talk a lot about like this month is our first. To Leah's point, we had five events last week, all different. Today is a new day for us. 
And what's beautiful about that is you guys are a part of our proof of concept. So you are here, we are learning, we are pivoting every single day to see what works. And so the idea that as a, as a business person, the idea that I get that canvas to be able to explore and ideate and pivot and change and think about all the different ways that we can bring together and weave together this amazing group of people and their skill sets is like a dream come true. When you work, I work a corporate job during the day, which I love, woohoo, I work at Nike and I really appreciate all that, that they've taught me there. But the reality of it is, it's still a corporate job. And so when I get to come here, I get to take all of that learning and help bring all of these skills to life. All right, so uh, you know, part of business is you know, sometimes thinking about how you can scale things. Mm -hmm. And we understand how you can scale, I don't know, like a McDonald's or a mm -hmm. Target maybe. Uh, is, is being so unique scalable? And as the business person, I mean, how do you manage a P&L of everybody kind of doing their own thing? Just oh curious. Okay. Well, let's talk first about the fun part of scaling unique things. Then we'll go to P&L. Okay. Because, <laughs> yes, you have to pay the bills. Um, I think that, you know, the beauty of being a space, a container, where we get to create one-of-a-kind experiences is really around connecting with your consumer. So I always use this analogy of, to all the, the points that have been made here today, at one point in time, we will have a different audience. We're gonna have a different audience in here after you guys leave this afternoon. And so really tailoring an experience to that audience enables you to scale the craft of what everybody brings just in a different way. It's not about, to your point, McDonald's, it's not about a template. It's not about driving efficiency and productivity and, and getting the most out there to the masses. It's much more about tailoring our concepts to our consumer. Um, again, I use this analogy of you could have um, 50 engineers from Intel here, and the things that they're interested in are gonna be very different than 50 footwear designers from Nike, or for that matter, the Better Business Association in Northeast Portland. So for us, the scalability is really around saying, what does our consumer want? What kind of stories are we telling? To your point, Leah. How are we gonna bring all of that together? And then how are we gonna duplicate that effort that we all put in, in different ways for different audiences? So that's where the fun is for me. Yes, there's obviously a profit at the end of all of that that we're all striving for. But the scalability is about the piece of having total freedom and autonomy and then turning that around into a new form of a business model. Um, you know, many of us on this panel have worked in really collaborative teams. I get to work in a collaborative team in my day job every day. And the critical part of collaboration is that everybody gets to come to the table with their craft and make decisions. And the minute one of those pieces falls apart, the system falls apart. And so that's really where autonomy and decision making and creativity comes into play here because as long as each of us are really healthy and we know that we have a role to play and we all give each other space to do that, that system of how our business grows and changes is holistic and it's healthy. So that, that kind of speaks to the behaviors mm -hmm. that you expect of the group. And um, you know, as you've communicated to me, you each kind of bring this separate canvas to the table. Yeah. So is every group kind of autonomous or every area autonomous and you each are additive? Mm -hmm. Is that how you're structuring it? Yeah, would you guys agree? I would too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's around, we're autonomous in that, again, I love to dream up how this business can change and what the next phase is and what the phase is three and five years from now and, and what will happen when we want to redo our patio and what that's going to do for our business or what happens when we, to Leah's point, take this on the road and we're in the wild, as we like to call it. Just saying, you'll see us in the wild soon. Um, what happens when we take it internationally? What happens when we launch products or build content or create cookbooks? I don't know, I mean, the sky is sort of the limit. And the beauty of that is that as long again, as, as we're all operating in our own autonomous, healthy way and we're making decisions and we're autonomous, on, new word, um, we're honest, <laughs> I'm making up words too, um, and we get to come together, then all of that can work. And I think that's where the living proof of concept is. If it doesn't work, we'll change. It's like our space every day. 
So I want to poke you a little bit about language, because one of the things you see in corporate America is the finance group speaks a different language than the marketing group, and the marketing group speaks a different language than you know the sales group or the design group or what have you. So really, in this microcosm, you have all of those things. Mm -hmm. Do you guys speak the same language? Hmm. That is a good question. I can't say I've ever considered it. Probably not. <laughs> But I think it comes together. I don't know. Would you guys agree? Ladies agree? I think we've learned how to tailor mm -hmm. really quickly. A mm -hmm. large part of what we do every day, we talk a lot about reinvention and pivoting. These are two words we use daily, or I use daily. Um, and so I think as soon as we landed here together and we said to one another, like, I support you. Mm -hmm. your, your role is this. You're accountable. A huge part of this project is accountability. You're accountable for this. You're yes. accountable for that. Sarah's accountable for th something else. And within that, we support one another and give each other space. But also, we ask questions. Um, we talk a lot about the things that are happening. And then we let, you know, even if Sarah says, I really want to make this thing, I might go, oh, maybe I want to eat that. Maybe I don't. But I'm like, I trust her. It's going to be delicious. And she's going to source it from the best place. Uh, the things that we've already agreed on, there's sort of a set of rules that we all agreed on in the beginning, and now we just have to follow that. And yeah. I think because we all operate from the same space on the inside, and yes, there are dollars and cents at the end of this project, but we approached this project as um, people first and passion first, um, assuming proof mm -hmm. of concept that the dollars and cents would come and they would all make sense, and so far, where I think our path is, um, we're, on, we're on that path and it's working. Yeah. And within that, every day we grow healthier and stronger as a group. I understand Sarah better every day. Leah lives with me, so I understand her really well. Um, and every day we, we get to know each other that much better and then we shift, right? We're not rigid in our thinking. And I think that's been a huge part of all of us also being women, mm -hmm. is that we came in saying, okay, I'm totally open. I'm ready to receive whatever you bring. And because we all had the same values, um, it worked. Yeah. And I mean, to your point on language, I think the one thing that we all understand is that, again, we have the awesome, amazing, timely opportunity of being women-owned and women-ran. And the reality of that is each of us have had an uh, experience in our own either workplace or industry or whatever that has cultivated this desire to be here and be with each other and do this new thing. And you know, back to scalability, we believe that our business is about positive social change. I mean, fundamentally, it's we all collectively agree that we want to lead and mentor girls and women. That's a huge part of our mission as well. And how we just decided that, you know, Michelle and I have been we fell in love a long time ago over food and, and design and all of these pieces. And now that we're here, it really became evident to us that we could have been dreaming about this idea for the next 10 years. But given the state of the world and given where we're all at professionally, now is the time to take the first step, check it out, see how it's going to work, and then again, we'll pivot as we grow. So I'm curious for all of you, this whole idea, because you know, even on your site and everything it talks, and you've talked a little bit about being women run and women owned. Mm -hmm. How important is that to what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Who wants to Anybody? take that one? Critical. I'm gonna go with 100% <laughs> critical. <laughs> I, I mean, I, we're, we keep talking about flexibility and being agile, and um, to some extent we're talking about empathy, right? Like people come in and they say they want something and we're somehow willing to give it to them. Like they're, what we're talking about here is a kind of female approach to business, which is um, ongoing change, flexibility, and collaboration, which doesn't necessarily always make money in a capitalist system, right? So. You know, we're hoping that it will, um, and I think that's what's sort of revolutionary about what we're, what we're thinking about doing. Um, but so for me, you know, it, it, being in a place where there isn't just one language that we are all using over and over and over again is both incredibly challenging, but also inspiring. And 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 I think that's key to why this is revolutionary. I mean, yes, we're in event space. Yes, we're offering classes. Yes, we're cooking food for people. That's not not new. 
what's new is how we're how we're thinking about that and how we're approaching it together. So. Nailed it. So I think we should see if there's any questions out there. I've exhausted a lot of the things, but I don't think they have exhausted at all what they have to say. So any questions from you guys? I don't want to. I don't want to run over the time and not leave time for that. Ah, the question is, why are they starting a Kickstarter campaign? Do you want to? All right. So, again, going back to where we are, you're at the Nightwood, um, the timeliness of that being women known and women ran. So we launched a Kickstarter campaign. Are we half? We're half. 20 days left, I think. 19. 18. It's all a blur. 18 days left in our Kickstarter campaign. And what we realized when we launched the Nightwood was that Funding for women-owned businesses is very, very, very tough to get. The reality of it is, in the world today, there is less than, you know, some statistics are somewhere between 5 and 7% from a venture capital standpoint that get invested in women's businesses, and even less than 5% of SBA loans go to women-owned businesses as well. So we took it to the street. We took it to all of you. The Kickstarter campaign is critical to funding the Nightwood and our success here. You know, you come into the space, it looks like an established space, right? It's got all the bones. But in order to really realize this true idea of a canvas and all of the things that we want to do with it, we need help with funding. And so we took it to the streets. We want to make sure that our community is a huge part of us being successful. And we've got 18 days left, so we encourage all of you guys to participate in that. And we've got totes for sale in the back, which will be great. Um, and you can carry it around. The future of food is female as you can see. Um, and yeah, anyone else want to add on that? Anybody want any additions? OK. Yeah. yeah, so community is such a big thing. So obviously, being able to draw from the com creative community, because this is everyone's space, is helpful. So tell everybody. Tell your friends. Go back to the office. Spread the word. Yes. The name. Who would like to talk about the name? Pam should talk about the name. <laughs> Uh, okay. oh. Well, the naming was an interesting process. I think we had a 48-page Google document that we all, um, but that's why I love Google Docs. Like, you can see people creating as you're in it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Michelle was, like, writing her life story into the Google Doc. I was talking about heartbreak. Someone else, what, I don't, you know, what else was going on in the Google Doc? Oh. Lots of, yeah. Yeah, cartel. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the cartel. Lots of funny words, good words and bad words all in there. Um, and I had just thrown in The Nightwood because it's a book near and dear to me by Juna Barnes. Um, you all should read it. Uh, and probably maybe have like a professor to help you through it. Um, uh, and oh God, it's such a hard book to describe, but Two, it, it's 200, it's only 200 pages, but it is one of the densest reads. It reads like prose. Mm -hmm. Poetry um, and prose yeah, at the same time. Beautiful and also extremely complicated <laughs> in its content. It, my, the simplest way that I can put it is that it's about being dispossessed and mm -hmm. trying to find a place in the world. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we were all doing when we were trying to come up with this space and how we wanted to run it and what we wanted to name it. We also talked a lot about magic, about the rabbit hole. Um, Alice in Wonderland kept coming up and somehow the Nightwood, outside of the book and what the book is, um, conjured a kind of mystery and uh, darkness, but a good darkness, and uh, the woods, um, the night. I mean, all of the, the, those things have energy, and that's the kind of energy that I think we are trying to conjure. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes? Ah, what made them say yes? How did you get five to ten women to say yes? Sure. Um, they would each have to express why they said yes. I invited each of them to this table that we've created. I simply decided I wanted to create a table for women to, to come together at. Um, I, every single person, even outside of, the, there's a few other people that aren't here today, um, even outside of the people that are sitting here that I invited in, uh, 
I knew them all very intimately, pretty intimately, Sarah probably the least. Um, and I went on this, I don't know, three, four month journey of trying to decide who would I, who do I want here with me? Um, who do I want to take on this journey with me? Who wants to come? Who's going to do this? When I come to them and say, oh, I'm, I mean, when we started this concept, we didn't have a space. I was looking at commercial buildings. We were going to do a whole build out. It was a whole, it was a business plan. It was like, okay, I want to do this thing. This is how I want it to feel. I want to do these things for women and for humanity. And I want to work in the social justice space. And I want to do all of this nonprofit work. How do I make this all happen in food? What is that going to look like? How am I going to make money? And I knew all of these incredible women from the industry that we all lived in. And I just started kind of like, scratching the surface a little bit. Leah first, maybe well, Katie first, Leah second. Um, and then I just started talking about it. And I think the magic was there. And as I invited them each to the table, ev I think every single person that, every single person I asked said yes. Not one single person said no, which is incredible. Um, and I actually was most concerned about finding the right I don't like this word chef, but I'll use it in this instance. Um, that was the one that I was most concerned about finding, especially a strong female with the right mindset and in the right space that she would want to, to come along with us. And so that one took me the longest to arrive at. And then I started spending time with Sarah. And I think it's when we went to Lovely's 50-50 that night, we had our, like, our first alone date where I really just put it out on the line. And she was like, yeah, I'm totally in. And I thought, oh my god, what? I can't believe these women want to do this with me. It was incredible. Um, so she turned down a job to move to LA to cook, um, to, to do this with us. It's pretty incredible. Um, just to add to that, I, you know, I think for me personally, because by nature of just meeting Michelle and then through Michelle meeting all of these amazing women and seeing how this quite honestly, this quilt is going to be stitched together. Um, when you have the opportunity, I've been extremely blessed to have an amazing career and a boatload of education, Just keeps going <laughs> all the time, um, that I have always been searching for an environment where I can pay that back and pay that forward. And so for me, the Nightwood is very much a platform to be able to do that for not only all of us in this room, I mean, all of us up here, but also everyone in this room and our community. And again, you know, leadership for girls and women is a huge part of what we're up to. And so for me, it's also about, you know, where do you start? It's looking at your values and saying, okay, I love what I do, eight to five, six to five, depends on the day, <laughs> nine to five. But what, what does that give me? And then what can I learn in that environment and pay it forward into my community? Selfishly, I'm multi-generational Portland, er. I guess that's what we call ourselves. And so I've just realized that in order to help shape this city and how the city is changing and growing at such a rapid rate, I had to get involved. And this is my level of involvement. Uh, how many of you are small business owners or sole proprietor? Wow. <laughs> so I was lonely, <laughs> basically. <laughs> as a small business owner doing all the things. Um, and in addition, as the Portland Meat Collective has, has always been sort of a, a part-time slash full-time thing for me. We've always been in other people's kitchens doing classes. Um, and it's always been hard because we come in, we do our thing, Sometimes we screw up the kitchen, <laughs> sometimes we don't, we leave. There's a group of chefs who are always like, what are you doing in my kitchen and why are there three sides of pig in my walk-in? So, you know, it's always been hard for us that way, but I've also felt like, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have enough help, I don't have enough support, I, and I'm the kind of person who does it all, wants to do it all, thinks she can do it all. And when Michelle and I started talking, she said, you know, why, what would it be like for you to be in a space in which you, A, weren't doing it all, but B, felt like you were a part of the kitchen, that you weren't just coming in and leaving, and um, having Sarah be a butcher is a huge help in that way, but being able to come into a space and feel like, oh, these are my people, we're all helping each other, we're all supporting each other, um, has been a, 
a great relief to me. And even having just someone as a small business owner like Michelle say, oh, you know, you, the photos on your website kind of don't match. Maybe we should make sure your photographers, <laughs> like, you know, brand that stuff. <laughs> like, that's helpful to me. I don't have time to think about that. And so having other people to do that with me is, is great. And that's why I said yes. Um, for me, I think it had a lot, well, timing was one thing, which thankfully worked in my favor. Um, I had recently left a business and um, that dissolved and needed a little break first. So that was nice to have a summer of fun. Um, and then, yeah, and also I think a big part of it for me was um, because I have been, I have run businesses in the past, um, had my own business, again, similar to Camus in terms of like taking a lot on and not really having a lot of mentorship through my career. Um, so what was really exciting to me was to be able to be here and have mentorship in a couple of different ways. I think both from Michelle and Katie on like a business level and creative and all that sort of stuff, but then also being, I don't know, feeling like you could work side by side with people and learn a lot from them through the process, just feel like there was a lot of people kind of like on the same level, if that makes yeah, sense. Sorry. Um, yeah, not a hierarchy, not to feel like I do need to take all of that responsibility on and have the support within this group. I think that was really exciting to me. Um, I couldn't really, when I was in my transition, I couldn't really even think of someone I wanted to work for, if I was to put it that way. Um, but I also knew I didn't really have it in my at the time to like start my own project again. So this was like really, again, the timing was perfect and the situation was pretty ideal, so. I got one. Oh, you got one. <laughs> I was told that somebody was going to teach me how to tweet. So I was like, <laughs> love to, because I've been trying to figure it out. I can't read it, I can't have do it. No, I have not no. learned yet. So I'm just like <laughs> waiting on that, but um, I think, also learning how to tweet, being able to learn the different aspects of the different business operations and that can come with it. So not just sitting in a kitchen all day chopping vegetables and cutting up animals, um, but also being able to sit down with Leah and create menus for people and create different things for different projects that we have in mind and talking about all the different opportunities that we can do within the space. And so for that, that like makes my brain like start to get excited, little sparks flying all over the place and being able to be creative on that side. Um, have helped me lead to saying yes and then being able to yeah work with Camus and teach people what I've learned and having people who are excited they're like I do want to learn how to make cookies or I do want to learn how to make sausage and being able to co-create with everybody and that opportunity as well as being able to support all the people who I've met over the last couple of years so all of the farmers the female beekeepers the people who support them so they have their nine to five jobs, but then they have microgreens available and they're just doing this little side thing. So now I could be like, hey, I would love to g give me your cute little micro flowers. I want to put them on everything. <laughs> um, and that's really rewarding for me too, to be able to like support all the ladies that I've been meeting who are doing these small little things that could have an impact on what we're doing. So that as well as just these ladies are good and they're cool and having a solid foundation helps out with making decisions like, do I want to work in this beautiful space? Okay, I'll do it. I just want to add one thing to what Sarah was saying too, back to the dollars in women's pockets. Um, that's a huge part of what we're doing. I mean, we're all making that personal choice, but then as a business, we're supporting as many female producers as possible. So we farm with a farm out on Savi Island that's women owned and run. We buy honey from a female beekeeper. We're working on getting pigs from um, a woman raising pigs. So this is a constant to how we develop our systems and producers into as many women as possible. Well, we have reached our 10 o'clock mark, so we want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. I think, you know, ultimately, this group is enabling women to think creatively and make their own decisions. It's lifting up women in a creative space that has the flexibility to move to the needs of the community. So if you want to be a part of that, definitely 
think about the Kickstarter in the back. If you can't be a part of it today, there are all different levels that you can join, so check out Kickstarter, and um, we really hope that you'll support the community that we're building here. Thank you.